Welcome to this new series of the Massey Dialogues. My name is Natalie DeRosier and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is located on indigenous land, the land of the Seneca, the Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful for their stewardship of the land and for the ability that we have to continue our work here. The Massey Dialogues are based on the idea of bringing together the voices of experts and the voices of the young researchers. This intergenerational aspect is key to the vision. We want to discuss issues of the day and hear different perspectives. I want to thank the Massey community for the wealth of good suggestions that we have received throughout the summer, and particularly to Keshna Sud and Michael Valpi for, and their committee for putting together this fall program. Enjoy today's discussion. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Michael Valpi. I'm a senior fellow at Massey College, and I'm hosting today's edition of Massey Dialogue. Our topic is right on top of the news, uh, how Canada is expected to pay its way out of its pandemic debt pay its way out of the billions of dollars we're in the hole, and what quality of life in the country we are going to build for the future. Childcare, pharmacare, safe elderly care with the bumps and divots of inequality smoothed out. The great thing about Massey College, and, uh, and I'd even like to go farther and say the greatest thing about Massey College, and, and remember this when you're considering where your charitable giving is going this year, the great thing about Massey College is the tremendous wealth of its intellectual resources. And we're gonna illustrate that today by bringing you three uh, outstanding Massey economists to, am to analyze our topic, leaving time at the end of their presentations and conversations for questions. Uh, Brett House is a senior fellow at Massey and deputy chief economist at so Scotiabank. His work over the past 20, 25 years has focused on fiscal policy, debt sustainability, and economic restructuring and financial markets policy institutions and academic research. Prior to joining Scotiabank, he was an economist at the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, where he helped lead debt relief programs for emerging markets and developing economies. He also served as principal economic advisor to the UN Secretary General on the global response to the 2008 financial crisis and the implementation of the Millennium Development Goals. Marie-Pierre Isabel was a junior fellow at Massey from 2012 to 2016 and is now an assistant professor at the Department of Economics at Université Laval a researcher at the Servo Brain Research Center and holder of the Sentinel North Partnership Research Chair in Economics and Brain Health. And I'd love to know how economics and brain health come together as with, as with the rest of you. Her research, her research address, addresses the intersection of economic inequality, health economics and labor economics, she completed her doctorate in, in economics at the University of Toronto and a postdoctoral fellowship at the James Ann and Kathleen D. D. Stone Center for the study of wealth inequality at INSET in Fontainebleau, France, rated the world's leading graduate business school. And our stage setting economist today is senior fellow Armin Yelnitsian the Atkinson Foundation's Fellow on the Future of Workers. She served as Senior Economic Policy Advisor for the Deputy Minister at Employment and Social Development Canada from 2018 to 2019. She helped lead the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives Inequality Project from, 2018, from 2008 to 2017. And 
as I'm sure many of you know, provided weekly business commentaries on CBC Radio and CBC Television from 2011 to 2018. And she's past president, president of the Canadian Association. I'm laughing because there's banging noises coming in from the side. Anyway, she's past president of the Canadian Association for Business Economics. Armin, I referred to you a few seconds ago as our stage setter. And what I'd like you to do over the next few minutes is present your ideal fiscal build-out from COVID. Do you think that, <laughs> excuse me, that there's a real chance, and this is a, a question from ordinary people, not a question for, from, for economists. Do you think there's a real chance we can build a better country from whatever the, the, the fiscal path is that we're taking? Are there signs we're heading into good new directions of permanent change around race, class, gender inequality in the workplace? Do you see, do you see any signs of optimism? And I'll wind my question up here. Do you see any signs of optimism in Christian Freeland's financial update, or is it all mainly fluffy rhetoric. The stage is yours. Go ahead. No pressure, eh? No um, pressure. I think it's actually appropriate that you have chosen me to set the stage, given the three, effectively three generations of Massey fellows uh, that you have assembled who are economists. Because I've worked more often than my colleagues have when it comes to recession. And this is unlike any other recession I have experienced or anybody with lived memory has experienced. Um, we have never experienced a moment where governments had to stop everything to be able to contain a contagion that is unlike anything we have seen in well over a hundred years. So, and actually is po poised to go get a lot worse in the coming months. So we're not through it yet by any stretch of the imagination. So to talk about what's on the other side of it is a little bit um, presumptuous because we don't know how bad it's going to get. And uh, that's, oh, I have to take my glasses off, eh? Ooh, there. Then you're not <laughs> seeing the, the big ring. Um, to, to talk about how we build back better is a function of what are we building on? And already uh, people like Dan Kelly of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business has warned that there have been a lot of deaths in the business community. They just haven't held funerals yet. So we are looking at quite a large scale of business devastation. And at the same time, um, devastation of lives of those workers who were already going into the recession, lower paid, people of color, recent immigrants, and most especially women. This is the first ever in history she session, which means simply that for the first time in history, when there has been an economic stoppage, more women lost their jobs than men. Now, every other recession is a he session. It has started in the goods producing sector. It could have been because of some kind of economic uh, calamity or financial calamity or even a natural disaster, but it almost always starts in the goods producing sector and then trickles out into the service producing sector. And almost it, and in every recession until this one, the initial stages of recovery have been women accepting more poorly paid jobs than men will accept because men have had higher wages and higher reservation wages. Uh, so they are not going to accept, you know, if they just lost a $30 an hour job, they're not going to quickly accept a $14 or $15 an hour job. But a woman will do that because family finances require it. Those jobs are, as I say, lower paid and in the service sector. Here we have a story that literally turns this whole narrative on its head. More women losing jobs than men initially, men catching up, more men getting back to work than women initially. The she covery has caught up with the he covery in sheer numbers of jobs, but not in the number of 
hours of paid work that women do. Per, and this is true of both male and female parents, but primarily falls on the shoulder of women because um, schools have reopened, but not always in a safe manner. And often people are keeping their kids home or either choosing to keep their ki kids home or having their kids sent home. So there's more unpaid care in terms of both childcare and homeschooling. So the ones that are lucky enough to be able to work from home, and that's only 40% of the entire labor force can work from home. And that's pretty consistent across every economy. Um, of course, they're not all parents, you know, some subsection of those people are parents and uh, not all of the parents are women. So it's a subsection of the people who can work from home that are there that, that are going to be able to afford to or even consider throwing in the towel after nine months of doing paid work from home, homeschooling and childcare. One of these things has got to give. And either your boss is going to figure that out for you or you're going to just say if you can afford it, can't keep doing these things indefinitely have to have to stop now not most people can't afford that financial choice so increasingly it is creating more stress on lower income households that either can't get back into the labor market if they lost their jobs um, because there's no available child care or there's no job to go back to don't forget a lot of the jobs that people were laid off from which were considered non-essential where non-essential services such as some forms of retail, some forms of um, bars and restaurants, um, uh, personal services like hair and nail salons, yoga classes, gym classes, that sort of thing. And of course, sports events, big things. Of course, travel, uh, particularly international and air travel. Um, and everything to do with taking care of our children, both schools, and childcare was initially shut down. That list of jobs that were deemed either essential, but we have to shut it down, which is schooling and childcare, and all the non-essential stuff is lower paid and um, female dominated. Okay. Some let of me, those- let me, ask, yeah. Armin, let me ask you this. When, when the pandemic started, uh, there was a lot of talk in the media and the public about Great, we've got a chance to fix a lot of these problems, fix a lot of the inequalities, uh, fix a lot of the racial inequalities, the gender inequalities, uh, people, but you know, workplace inequalities. We're now seven or eight months into this, and I don't hear much talk anymore about fixing this, these inequalities. Are you hearing anything different? I didn't hear much about fixing the inequalities in the workplace other than introducing things like paid sick leave, which has still not materialized in most of the jurisdictions that have control over most of the labor force. Um, we do have federal programs. The federal government has done almost all of the heavy lifting. We learned on Monday through Christopher Phelan that about 83% of everything that's been done to deal with the pandemic has been done through federal heft. Um, the provinces are not MIA by any um, uh, by any stretch, but they are doing they are capable of doing less, and they have been doing less. Um, and uh, the federal supports that are there have actually reduced inequalities because so many people that were people of color, women, young people, recent immigrants were not eligible for the income supports that were available through employment insurance, for example. So CERB was a great leveler in terms of being able to help people stay at home. But this um, is all so we, good. This is that, good. That yeah. part of it is good, but that's not going to last after the pandemic. No, you can't. No, you, no, no. The type of income support you have in place to contain a contagion is not the type of income support you have in place in an era where population aging is going to mean that we have a smaller cohort of working age people supporting a larger cohort of people too old, too young, and too sick to work. So you can't afford to just throw money around to help people stay at home whenever they feel like it. We're going to have a real review of income support programs down the road when we get through the pandemic. Thankfully, we expanded income supports for the working age so that they don't have to scramble for work. And there, there, there are leaves for people 
that do get sick and need to be quarantined. Um, and that's all paid for by the federal don. Um, but we haven't seen a catch up at the provincial level, which governs employment standards and labor laws um, for over 90% of the working population. And the fact is we've got four or five jurisdictions that have no truck nor trade with improving the world for workers, no matter how they couch themselves as being populists, so, they really so are a pro worker. We don't see anything coming toward us down the line that says there's going to be permanent fixes here, eh? We see things coming down the line saying we need to seriously talk about what the world looks like post pandemic. And what we have is a series of jerry rigged um, responses that are working quite well in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, the rent supports for businesses, the wage subsidies for businesses, the loans for businesses, the income supports for workers that are furloughed or lost more than half their hours. We're going to see more training programs, I imagine, in the coming uh, months. What we haven't seen yet is supports for the most critical part of our social infrastructure for women. No recovery without a she recovery, Michael. No she recovery without childcare. And childcare in this country is treated like any other business. It's not treated like a social infrastructure. So we're losing capacity as we speak. So we're going to need to do something about that piece of it. We heard about it in the fall economic statement. But it's like, watch this space. We're going to tell you what we're going to do by the spring. We'll talk about that more to come. But the fact is, we have this alarming consensus across political positions, across business and labor. Everybody agrees we need early learning and childcare, not just childcare to warehouse kids so mommy and daddy can go back to work, but early learning and childcare. So we will get progress on that side. That will make a huge difference to inequality. We may see pharmacare that also will materially make a difference to lived inequality and literally put money in your pocket. We should see more housing. I think we we may see that in the spring budget that like who knows what's going to happen on that front. So these uh, basic services, the things that people rely on, should we spend more on them and make them more affordable and higher quality literally will put money in your pocket every bit the same way as tax cuts will. So I see. Uh, I see a potential future where, in fact, inequalities are reduced. The lived impact of inequality is reduced, though it may not reveal itself as less income inequality or even less wealth inequality, uh, which hmm. is kind of um, ironic. But still, the lived experience might be more equal and more opportunities for more people. That's what we're going to have to do, actually. It, and this is what makes me hopeful about the future in a way that no other previous recession could have made me hopeful, is that the fact that we've got record numbers of people exiting the labor force and record low numbers of people entering the labor force because of falling fertility rates for decades, um, and thus far not really generous immigration and uh, ent entry requirements for labor shortages, we can also get into that, but to the extent that this is a story that's not gonna go away for three more decades, we're going to have some kind of a um, reckoning about what the role of government is for and who governments are for in the coming decades. And we're already seeing it with the Build Back Better motif that is coming out of the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, our government, um, many governments around the world talking about we, we need more government. We need government to do more stuff. If we're going to spend this kind of money, we should actually create a better platform for growth uh, that well, maximizes it's, it's, more people's potential. It's great to hear your optimism about this. And when you put your Armenian Leipzian citizen Armenian hat on, you actually feel optimistic about where we're going once the pandemic starts winding down and we get, you know, the vaccinations into our arms and all the rest. You, you, you do feel positive about this. There's going to be permanent change. change. No, I didn't say that. I said, I see more of an opening for that than I have ever seen in my life. Whether we choose that path, like everything else about the pandemic is unclear. You would think in March that we wouldn't be running around going to barbecues, you know, like going shopping on Black Friday, which isn't even a Canadian holiday. So people are just 
not doing what they know is what in their best what is in their best interest so we could definitely choose not to do what is in our best interests these choices are political we may elect out governments that wish to behave that way and elect in governments that convince the population with the best you know he with the he or she with the best narrative wins the story and right now as build back better gains momentum internationally so does its counterpart which is the great reset is a globalist strategy to give governments more power and take more power away from you. So the counter narrative right. is already out there. And which one will grip more people's attention will determine what kind of uh, uh, governments we elect and and will determine what kind of path, you know, path they wish, uh, course they wish, wish to chart. And I don't know what the answer is, but I got to say the elements are there for a true uh, pivot from the last 40 years, which has been about trickle down theory, give the wealthy more money so they can create wealth and, and create jobs in the meantime, um, which has been a social experiment that failed on its own terms. Um, and the pursuit of the, the last 40 years has been government's primary pursuit is to grow GDP. And the way you prove you've done that is by attracting more foreign investment, lowering taxes, uh, cutting services, mm -hmm. making sure governments are living within their means, all of that sort of thing, all about the money. And we're, the pandemic is forcing, pouring accelerant on the fact that population aging, if nothing else, was going to force us to think about well-being. And are we stewarding our resources in a way where we can actually take care of one another in an era of slow and slowing growth because of population aging yeah. and because of climate chaos so we are pivoting from one modality to another but like it's an it's an, an antonio gramsci moment it's like the end of one version of capitalism or the end of one version of what's normal is over but we are not yet into the new normal and this interregnum is up to us what direction we pivot towards. And that's yeah. what I am hopeful is that people understand it's in our hands to build whatever kind of world we want. Well, it's interesting that you're saying this because as you, I'm sure are aware that the economists, the sort of the Bible of the other side, uh, uh, well into the pandemic, said okay we we need government we need a stronger presence of government in 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 the lives of citizens but we should be planning now how to push it back and get it out of the way uh once the pandemic uh, starts to ease off do you think that that is going to be a dominant narrative let's get government out of the way again 100 percent. that's what the great reset is about Really, the moment we are in is not different than the moment we were in before. It is a debate between how big should government be and who should it serve. That has always been the case. The economy is a political beast. The way governments choose to write rules, rewrite rules, um, who they choose to support and how they choose to support them, where the priorities are, that's always political choice. So every economy is all you know when we talk we we talk in these broad brush strokes about capitalism working or not working there's as many different brands of capitalism even within a country as there is types of beers you can get at the beer store you know it's just like it's it's folly to think that it's one thing and we will create whatever the thing is that we choose collectively to either that we either collectively actively choose to create or fail to act, fail to engage, and let those who are playing shape the game. And that's okay, another I'm gonna, part of the game. I'm going to give you a rest for talking, and and uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to Brett and have Brett talk to us about the macroeconomic narrative um, and where where he thinks we're going. Brett, over to you. Thank you, Michael, and thanks, Armin, for setting the scene. Um, what I want to do is set a bit of perspective around those priorities and that pivot that Armin is calling for, and certainly align myself, as maybe no bank economist has ever done before, with the Gramscian moment that she's calling for. 
there is certainly an opportunity to build back so and just, to build just back tell better. Us who, Brett, just tell us who Gramsci is. For those oh, of Antonio us Gramsci the is, uh, 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 you know, socialist thinker, uh, social revolutionary who, in contrast to, uh, you know, Marxist Leninists, uh, proposed a more gradualist uh, theory of change as opposed to a revolutionary theory of change. Uh, I'm sure for the political philosophers and theorists uh, in the Massey community, I'm bastardizing him terribly by reducing him to that, but that 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 would be my quick thumbnail on okay. uh, how we Go think ahead. about Gramsci. Go ahead, thank you. Um, and so in, in that Gramscian tradition, as I'm characterizing it, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to talk about living within our means. Uh, Armin mentioned that, you know, that's one of the traditional pushbacks to a more ambitious approach to making a more inclusive, uh, more equitable, and more effective economic system for greater well being for a greater number. And, you know, this recession, as she mentioned, has been different in many different ways uh, from others before it. What's particularly notable is that unlike almost any other recession with the possible exception of the 1930s, it's affected every place in the world at the same time. And it has been characterized by policymakers everywhere uh, putting into place massive spending to bridge households and businesses through the pandemic and to uh, the post-pandemic period where vaccines are ubiquitous and we can go back to living more normally. All of that's predicated on the idea that uh, businesses that worked before the pandemic, households that were solvent before the pandemic, shouldn't be allowed to fail now because of something out of their control. And that would ultimately be costlier to all of us if they were allowed to become insolvent now. Uh, but as you know, that notion of living within our means uh, implies at some point there's a limit, at some point there's a reckoning, at some point there is a wall by, but beyond which spending can't go any further. And, and so I wanna talk through you know, some of the ways in which that limit is characterized and some of the ways in which I think it's uh, mischaracterized and used as a cudgel uh, to prevent people from thinking big and thinking in a Gramscian or even a more revolutionary way on social policy and uh, knock down some of the shibboleths on what we can and can't do. Uh, one of the ideas that gets invoked here is the idea of modern monetary theory. And again, one of the hallmarks of MMT is that a country that issues debt in its own currency can effectively issue a limitless amount of debt because it can always pay it back by inflationary means that inflate the value of that debt away. It can keep printing more money and printing more debt and printing more money again to pay for it. Um, that, that theory uh, implies to some that there's a limitless free, month, free lunch and that you know, there are no means that are too large. Um, what is interesting about it is that we are effectively in an MMT moment right now, or as Does Keynes would have called, does right. debt and matter? In, and in an MMT framework, it doesn't matter until inflation begins creeping up again, and we're a long way from inflation doing so. And so it implies that we still have a lot more runway to go before we hit a point where we have to scale back on our spending. And even orthodox organizations like the IMF agree that the biggest danger right now isn't spending too much, it's spending too little. Uh, to counteract the pandemic. And this is really just bridging us through. It's not even getting to the point where we start building back better in some of the ways that our means spoke to. As we get to that point, either where the pandemic's under control or we start hitting those bounds where investors aren't willing to keep buying our bonds and the interest that gets charged on them creeps up or inflation starts creeping up because we've actually got economic demand back in place and we're seeing some recovery, some of the rules that govern how we think about what are the means we have at our disposal are principally the ratio of public debt to total economic activity in our economy, the debt to GDP ratio. 
Some studies have suggested the limit there is 60% of GDP or 80% of GDP. Most of the studies there have been proven to be unrobust over time, so those are not hard and fast rules. Canada right now is projected to hit 50% of GDP at the end of this year, so we are not even coming close yet to what many other countries are doing in terms of expanding their debt. And that means we have a lot of cushion ahead of us, a lot of room to keep building. The better ratio or the better measure I would propose is looking at uh, the size of our debt versus the future stream of economic activity. So not GDP for one year, but the discounted value of all future years of GDP. And when interest rates are as low as they are, it means that that discounted stream of economic activity gets larger and larger and larger to the point that you know, it pushes the denominator in that ratio so big that it pushes the whole thing down to zero. It implies in an MMT kind of way, you can keep spending and borrowing for a very long time. So, and so really what you're saying, Brett, is really, really interesting. We, we, we don't have to panic. Uh, we don't have to start throwing ourselves out the, out the windows of Bay Street. Um, we can actually talk about uh, building a better Canada, building back better, building a green Canada or, or uh, child care or pharmacare. We can, or, or better long-term care. We can do all these things, yes? Well, you know, I think the things that you've just described are all things that fit into, again, a pretty orthodox framework. And that, as David Dodge, the former governor of the Bank of Canada, laid out, debt is also viewed as being sustainable over time, so long as our rate of growth is higher than the rate of interest that we're paying on that debt. And right now, the rate of interest is incredibly low. It will creep up at some point. It might even jump at some point. But the, the initiatives you mentioned are all things that can increase productivity as well as making Canada more equitable, more sustainable, uh, fairer. And to the extent that it increases productivity at the same time, it ensures that that debt is sustainable to be paid over time. So we That's don't positive. have to choose between one or the other. But keeping productivity in mind at the same time as we keep equity in mind is critical for long-term solvency. Right. Right. Um, I, I don't want to cut you off if you've got more you want to put into the debate at this point, but I, I would be interested in, in what Marie-Pierre thinks of this as to whether she's in agreement with you, if I can put it this way, Marie-Pierre, that <laughs> if we're going to go ahead with these other programs, that this is a this is almost a good time to do it because as Brett says, you know the interest rates are low. There is we're all MMTers now, <laughs> uh, and before this session, I had no idea what MMT stood for. Uh, we don't have be to, one more to, acronym in your life. <laughs> we don't we don't have to be panicking. Uh, about overspending, and, and we can ignore Andrew Coyne and John Iveson and all these people in the National Post and the Globe and Mail. Anyway, your thoughts on this? <laughs> well, you, you see, I don't think we should. It, it's it's great to have people coming at from different perspective on this one. My perspective is probably <laughs> also closer to Brett. Um, and, and the way I like to think about it, um, probably in a bit of a, an economic C jargon, is that everything has an opportunity cost, right? Every choice you make implies an option you, do, you don't take. And in the case we're in, uh, the opportunity cost of not investing, of not acting, is actually not zero. On the contrary, it's extremely high because if we don't invest right now to make sure that we have room for everyone in a post-pandemic economy, uh, growth isn't going to be as strong as it could be. So, so I think in this case, we're in, a, we're in a great situation where it's easy to realize the opportunity cost of actually being too prudent. Um, and I'm not a macroeconomist, but it, it seems to me that we're at a great point in history 
to realize the, the potential short, long and medium term benefits of, you know, being a, a little bit more proactive on the spending side. Um, and just to pick up perhaps where Brett left, it's actually super interesting to me that if you listen to Christian Freeland on Monday or if you listen to other governments putting forward their, you know, post pandemic recovery plan, one thing that keeps coming over and over again is this recovery has to be green. Uh, and, and I couldn't agree more on this, although it's not my area of expertise. Um, but also that it should be sustainable and inclusive. And it's funny to me that people are using these two terms as if they were two different concepts, because really to me, they're just two sides of the same coin. We're not gonna have a sustainable recovery if it's not inclusive. Uh, Armin was talking about you know, changing demographics and how it affects the size of the labor force, for instance. And recognizing that is recognizing that we need to be able to include everyone in the labor force that, that has, you know, that is, capacity to be on the labor market right now. Um, and the sad truth is that the pandemic not only has added inequality to the mix, but it has compounded inequalities um, that were pre-existing. So people who were of people, people who are people of color, women, low income workers have been more badly hit by the pandemic. And as we think of ways to recover, we have to think, I think, in priority about these people. So earlier you were asking, you know, um, are, are you guys hopeful about um, about inequalities being reduced? Or do you think inequalities have actually been pushed under the rug a little bit as we're talking about vaccines and, and people dying from, from COVID? And I think now more than ever, these inequalities are, are pretty obvious to everyone. You know, we all understand, or hopefully we all are aware of the fact that people were losing their job in a, in a non-recoverable way right now or in a way that's harder to recover are people who also happen to be low income to begin with. They're also people who used to be marginalized to begin with. And another thing that this pandemic has shown us, I believe, is that flexibility and the capacity to adapt is heavily correlated with pre-existing privilege and pre-existing socioeconomic status. Um, I'm super lucky. I'm a university professor, uh, which means that even if my childcare is canceled, even if I can't send my, my kids to school or to daycare, um, I'm lucky enough to be able to work from home and to have her play in the living room while I try to teach my students or while I try to mark essays. Someone who works in a shop, for instance, if their daycare is canceled, that absolutely doesn't mean the same for me, which means that as we realize that through the pandemic, we should be even more sensitive to the fact that we need good childcare to be able to have an inclusive economy. And on that, I completely agree with Armin. It has to be part of, um, of the recovery uh, conversation. I'm also lucky enough to happen to live in Quebec City and I, I lived in Quebec for a couple of years before coming back. And it hit me throughout the pandemic how lucky we are to have this great system in place that allows uh, women to, to have more flexibility to be part of the, of the um, of the labor force and although daycare had to be shut down for for a little while the chic recovery is way stronger in quebec than it is elsewhere and i believe that the fact that you know daycares are are available to most people to most women to most families is actually a big part of that there's a few other steps that we can think of when we think about an inclusive recovery that are not easy to take but are quite straightforward to think about um are not easy to implement but straightforward to think about one is access to broadband internet uh, I know it seems like we've been talking about this for, you know, decades now, and, and it's because we actually have been talking about this for decades. But as we realize how much being able to work remotely may become important, either because we might face other pandemic threats or because, you know, labor markets adapt and it might be required from people to work more from home for a certain period of time, even after a vaccine comes. Uh, we did realize during the pandemic where it became more obvious that remote communities actually are far from all having a good access to internet, which also compromise their capacity to participate in this new economy that's gonna be the one in which we recover. Um, and so that's another thing to keep in mind. Another quick thought, and I'm trying to wrap this up all very quickly so that we can all interact together after, but another thing that I think is important to keep in mind is the fact that economics research, either in, in well, in labor economics mostly in the past uh, decades, has shown how difficult it is for cohorts graduating in recessions or graduating in hard economic times 
to have a path as they start their career that's going to be as good as if they had graduated in normal times. Um, and, and this will be compounded as a difficulty for, for graduating Canadians right now and graduating students around the world by the fact that students or people starting their careers are not only the first one to be laid off in difficult times, but they are also more concentrated in certain industries which have had uh, hard difficulties during a pandemic. Think about students you know, who were starting their, their careers in a more service-led industry, uh, in, in industries where the, the demand has uh, plummeted in the past few months um, or in the past last months. So I think paying a special attention to including young Canadians in the, in the recovery and, and being aware of the hard challenges that they're going to face as they start their career is extremely important. And, um, and that, that is also true of marginalized uh, communities across the country who also have had hit harder during the pandemic. And, and academic research has shown that you know, losing your job um, has some long-term consequences, both in terms of labor market outcomes, but also in terms of mental and physical health. And that's the last point I want to bring home before uh, before I stop talking. But um, one thing we know as well from research that has been done um, in the, academy, in the uh, academic community is that growing inequalities also come at a very high cost in terms of people's health. And once the virus is sort of under control and once we have a vaccine, we, I think, will start observing more and more of the cost that this pandemic will have in, on Canadians' health apart from the virus threat. Um, and you know, changes in absolute, but also changes in relative income. So changes in where you are in the income distribution and how far you are from other people in the income distribution has actually pretty sensible, uh, pr pr pretty important, sorry, impacts on people um, mental health, but also potentially on their physical health when they're under, you know, chronic stress of, am I gonna find a job? Am I gonna be able to keep my job? Where do I send my kid? It's, it's, to daycare, to school, can I, can I afford that? How do I keep them home if I have to? Um, so I think being aware of this as we enter in, in the recession is gonna be important. And that's where both provincial and federal governments have a huge role to play in terms of ensuring that we're ready to, to face those challenges and to help the Canadians who are gonna need it. Okay, you, you lead us nicely into two questions I have that I wanna bring all three of you in to. Um, is there any point at this point in us, in the federal government bringing in the, I forget the name of it, the Emergency Measures Act and having a stronger role? I mean, our mean started off by saying, gee, what the federal government has done is pretty good. And I know from uh, talking to pollsters that Canadians are far more supportive of what their federal government is doing than what the provincial governments are doing in Quebec and Ontario, especially in Alberta, uh, which has been, you know, hardly had anything good to say about the feds. And, you know, are, are, do we advance the, our path out of this if we give the federal governments more powers? That's my first question. And then secondly, Brett, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know if you could help us by comparing where Canada is and the rest of the world, the rest of the developed world. So if, if the three of you could grapple with those two questions, um, I'd appreciate it. Go ahead. Okay, I'll jump in oh. because uh, <laughs> if, I, it, it, if you've seen me at all, uh, while other people have been talking, I've been scrambling to try and figure out how to keep my phone alive because I can't hear anything without my headphones in. And that's my input for my phone dying. So if I disappear, it's not because I don't love you. Anyway, okay. <laughs> going back to it, 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 um, going back to should we give the feds more power? No. <laughs> <laughs> they've got plenty of power we just need we've got actually a terrible process to forgetting uh human services to humans and it requires two and sometimes three levels of government to cooperate so it requires governments getting along now we're entering a period where this is unusually there's a lot of friction but it is totally unusual 
we should not be rewriting constitutions at this point to give the feds more power because who knows who could get elected in next time and maybe you don't want them to have that much power so we're fine with the uh, distribution and the jury constitutional division of powers we just need governments to get on with doing their job which is governing for the people yeah i'd certainly yeah, agree with our being Go ahead, go Barry Pierre. Barry Pierre, go ahead. I, I was just about to say, I also think it might not be a question of do we want to give X or Y government more power, but one thing that seems pretty important to me is to think about uh, having programs that are more responsive, having programs that are more flexible. So many of our social infrastructure in Canada or our social programs are subject to a bajillion rules that make it harder for them to adapt to what citizens are living in terms of problems, difficulties, and, and those problems and difficulties can evolve quite quickly as we figured out in March. And I think you know the first half of the pandemic showed us how important it is to have programs that can actually be flexible and adapt to what people need. Um, and so without giving more powers to government, I think we should press our governments to actually make sure that they renovate some of these social programs to make them easier to um, to respond to the needs of Canadian, to make them perhaps more integrated with the tax system so that, you know, as your income drops, you don't need to fill in three bajillion forms to make sure you get help, but that, you know, some of these helps come naturally as you flow in and out of the labor force, for instance, that you need fewer conditions to qualify, that you need to justify your needs or your problems a little less so that you get money when you need it, which then goes into the economy and helps families, help marginalized people, also help businesses. You know, I think this is where um, power doesn't need to be redistributed, but we need to make sure that our programs give citizens some power when they need it. But, but we've seen examples of where the feds have stepped into provincial territory to support things like rent, to support things like wages. Um, you know, I mean, uh, the, the federal government had to do this because the provinces either wouldn't or couldn't. And it wasn't uh, a constitutional... Uh, um, I don't know what you call it, but a, a, the word I was thinking of is actually kind of rude. But but the uh, it's not a it's not a constitutional blowout. It's just that it was better to the federal government moved on this. So just um, to your question, then, uh, Michael, it isn't about more power. I mean, the federal government always has spending power. The question is, when do mm -hmm. they want to use it? Uh, they, the federal government, more than any other jurisdiction, always has federal uh, has spending power because it can issue bonds, uh, and you and provinces can do that too. But it's a, a debt instrument. What the federal government can do that provinces can't do is actually, you know, have a program that sends people to the moon, <laughs> like actually right. do stuff that wouldn't otherwise be done. And in the process of doing that thing, you literally create money. That's really what MMT is. It isn't a printing press. It is saying that for certain things that we want to get done, we will bankroll these things. And in the process of bankrolling these things, we literally create money. Uh, okay. It, it's not just by printing it that you create the money. So Got the you. federal government has a lot okay. of fi firepower whenever it wants to use it. Brett, and your thought, Michael. Well, the federal government had more uh, dry powder to use here than the provinces. Yeah. It had, you know, better a better balance sheet, lower debt than many of the provinces going into this, and more room to maneuver. So, you know, regardless of constitutional considerations, it was the appropriate level to act here because it had more space to do so. And it has acted in a way that is unparalleled across any other industrialized economy. As a percentage of our total economy, Canada has spent more than any other industrialized country in the world and on par with really any country in the world in its COVID-19 response. So really? you know, some of the reaction, absolutely, yeah. you know, as the OECD yeah. and the IMF have both verified with comparable data, so some of the discussion, you know, from some critics in the opposition of the federal economic statement on Monday saying it was an austerity budget, uh, I think was really off the mark. Uh, <laughs> we have spent more than any other country in the world. 
And we have the space to do it because coming into the crisis, we had the lowest gross and net uh, debt levels for any national government in the industrialized world. And even after all that spending, we're still at the bottom of the pack. And you want to be at the bottom of this ranking rather than the top. Hmm. So I, I just want to pick my- back on what Brett just said, because Mary Pierre raised exactly the right issue, which is what kind of programs do you have in place that give people power when they need it? One of the reasons we had so much firepower is back in the 1990s, the federal <laughs> government literally walked out the back door, cut transfers to the provinces, cut unemployment insurance, cut all the major cost expenditures to sanitize their bottom line and bring their spending back into balance. Uh, 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 A thing that you may love or hate, but certainly uh, gave Paul Martin and the Liberals lots of points amongst the crowd that says, thou shalt balance thine thine books. Is that a biblical saying? Anyway, to (laughs) to Marie Pierre's point, Um, One of the reasons why we were able to use our firepower and why we had it is because we were actually, if you go to the same charts that Brett is talking about, we were spending far less as a country on public spending and public social programs than most European nations. They had way better jobless benefits, way more access to economic stabilizers when people lost their uh, work uh, jobs. So they didn't have to do as much heavy lifting during the pandemic as we did. So we did spend a lot more relative to what we were spending. And we are still now below the middle of the pack in terms of total social spending, notwithstanding what Brett said. So yeah, we got lots of room to go if we still want to go. And in so doing, we should be spending money in a way that builds up the economy, creates productivity, maximizes potential, introduces all the things that can push forward our you know, economic frontier. So before and we just that, that, before we before we pat Justin Trudeau and Ms. Freeland on the back, we should hear we should hear what you just said. We we were coming from behind. Oh yeah. Yes? I mean, yeah. Very yeah. pure. Yeah. And Michael, just just one other thing. We shouldn't forget, like when we're comparing where Canadian or federal money went compared to provincial money went, we shouldn't forget the fact that health health and healthcare are actually a provincial jurisdiction, right? So I just want to highlight the fact that our provincial governments were also pretty busy fixing hospitals and making sure that, you know, COVID and non-COVID patients could be um, could be treated and for better or for worse, figuring out also what was going on with long-term care for elderly. So I think, you know, in terms of who spent where, there's also that aspect of the question to consider. And just to complement what, um, what Armin was just saying, uh, in terms of thinking through our social programs as we embark on the recovery, one thing that we and our government, I guess, should probably keep in mind is the fact that a lot of people will be jumping into new careers and that these careers are probably not going to look like the careers they had before in a lot of cases. A lot of people are going to start um, jumping into part-time work, into gig work, probably more than pre-pandemic because things are shifting, obviously, in terms of, of labor market, but it, also in terms of consumption uh, patterns from, from consumers. And so if we have more people, especially more young people and more already low income people jumping into these kinds of of jobs, it's extremely important to make sure that we have very responsive social programs when when they need it. Um, And even more so than before, I think. Why why do you think this workplace shift is going to come? Because businesses are fragilized. Every recession. It happens to wake up every recession. It does happen as a result of It happens as a result of every recession, and it's also accelerating trends that were in place already around technological change uh, and uh, forces from globalization, you know, that have pushed us out of some sectors and into some others. I think the obituaries that got written for globalization at the onset of the lockdowns in the spring were massively premature. In fact, if anything, we haven't seen trade collapse in any way that we expected at that point. We see it intensified. And you know, countries that have uh, diversified sources of goods and services are proving to be more resilient than than those that have tried to gather uh, production, you know, back at home or in one or two places. Hmm. So, 
really there's not grounds for and, and I guess it's time to start winding up here that there's not grounds for a, a, a lot of pessimism in the country. Yes, I think, I think there's I'm grounds for some prudence. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think Prudence. we lost our, our mean here potentially, uh, yeah. but she was rightfully pointing back to the 1990s and the fact that federal spending came down substantially. And in part here, I'm trying to pick up a question that's in the chat. At that time, we weren't living within our means. On that rule that David Dodge proposed that growth has to get ahead of the rate of interest we're paying on our debt, we weren't satisfying that rule. Actually, interest uh, was higher than our growth rate and the amount of our federal budget that we were devoting just to servicing our debt was spiraling upward and that was crowding out social spending. So that's why, you know, the, the notion of living within our means is still relevant. It's just that right now with interest rates so low, we've got a lot more space to spend and borrow uh, to build a better Canada and enhance uh, productivity before we start hitting up against that constraint. And I think you know, we have to keep that prudence in mind because we can spend more, but we've got to ensure that it's not just generating a greener, more equitable economy, but generating higher growth as well so that we can pay for that debt one day. The last yeah. question. I'd also argue, oh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, go ahead, MP. I also just wanted to say that I think, you know, there's no time for pessimism people are hurting. Uh, and so I think if, you know, we don't look at this as an opportunity, we're, we're going to miss it. And it's going to be, then we'll have like exposed reason to be pessimistic. Um, but, you know, the fact that we've all become more aware of some of the inequalities that were heightened during the pandemic, but existed before, is actually a, a good reason to believe that we can no longer ignore them. But I don't hear enough I don't hear political leaders, academic leaders, business leaders talking about opportunity, an opportunity for a new world, a new Canada. I'm, I'm not hearing that. Are you or either of you? I think that's what Build Back Better is trying to summarize. It's the better yeah. part there that is the optimism and is the opportunity. and. First, we have to build back, but I think we have to do so with a mind that puts into place some of the foundations to make it better as we do so. Do you, do you feel optimistic about that, about opportunity as a banker? I, I absolutely do. I mean, I think pessimism over time has historically uh, been the wrong side of history at moments like this. I think yeah. back to September 11th, for instance, when you know, I was living in DC and my sister in New York and, you know, pundits at the time thought both cities were dead, that no one would live, you know, in downtown right. Manhattan. There are more people living and working there now than at any point in its history. Of course. Uh, of I course. think, you know, while things are, are changing, you know, there's some, you know, human, human truths, some sociological needs that we're going to keep reverting to, too. And, uh, and I think, you know, there are real possibilities embedded in the moment we're at yeah. now. Folks, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Armin, wherever you are, thank you to you as well. <laughs> uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, if for no other reason that I've learned what MMT stands for. And um, thank you so much. All the best to you. Bye.